Praise God. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or can show forth all his praise? Our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant, who is devoted to fearing you. Amen. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Deceitful man, oh, deliver us. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? I walk around confused. Sin
scripture of the week is uh, Matthew 6, 20 through 21. Uh, hold on. <laughs> but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. in heaven the moth and rust do not destroy and with thieves do not break in and steal the store up for yourselves treasures in heaven the moth and rust do not destroy and with thieves do not break in and steal where your treasure is there your heart will be also for where Treasure is a store up for yourselves, treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. A store up for yourselves, treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. There your heart will be also where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. There your heart will be also where your treasure is. epistles this year over the course of the year we're getting closer to the festival of tabernacles so we're wrapping things up so we have a few more left so uh, this week we'll be reading james uh chapters one and two okay. james a bond servant of god and of the lord jesus christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greetings my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, for, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am, tempt I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, but you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that, no, that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, so speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? 
Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. For someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without... Uh, but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Hold on. This is faith. <laughs> I do want to know. <laughs> <laughs> was, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son to the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by, wor by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see, then, that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. All right, um, let's see how well we were paying attention, shall we? It's time to play Know Your Bible. Da da da! <laughs> All right, so how are we supposed to view trials? Are we supposed to view them as suffering, as joy, as a sign of God's existence, or as a way to get free software? <laughs> how does temptation happen? God tempts us, nature tempts us, we are drawn by our own desires, or somebody posts a delicious picture of chocolate. What makes one's religion useless? An unbridled tongue, a bad relationship, not reading the Bible, or unsubscribing to Blair Church. <laughs> I don't recommend D, but that's not what James was talking about. <laughs> All right. Uh, little outro here. Hello! Um, let me try to get my shot lined up here, if I can. Da, da, da. Technology. Alright, so, I've been doing a series about logical fallacies, and today I want to discuss what is known as the Texas Sharpshooter. This might be my favorite logical fallacy to talk about, because it's one you don't hear about very much, and it's probably, well, I wouldn't say it's the most common, but it is very common. It's particularly common within the world of religion. So let's talk about the Texas Sharpshooter. So the story of the Texas Sharpshooter is this man says, I am the best shooter in, I don't know, Dallas or whatever he says. So he goes out to his field and he brings out a shotgun and he starts launching a bunch of bullets at this uh, fence, right? And so he just shoots, 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 shoots. And then finally, when he's all done, he looks at the bullet holes and he goes and he paints a bullseye. <laughs> and then he says, see, perfect bullseye. Now, obviously, we can see the logical fallacy in that, right? Uh, the man did not set out to specifically hit those targets. He did it retroactively. Now, how this happens in arguments is what people will do is they will look at a whole bunch of data and then they will draw a circle around it and then make the conclusion that that data points to something when, it, in fact, it does not. This happens all the time. The specific data makes it clear that my point is correct is the fallacy because uh, there's a few issues. One, well, as we could see in that other example, it was eliminating all of the other bullet holes, right? So you just made a point of that one. And then the other point is, well, was there even a cause and effect that you're even indicating, right? Because he launched the bullet and then he said, well, that's what I was trying to hit. But that really wasn't what he, what he, he was even looking for, right? He only thought about it retroactively. So both things can be a problem and why this fallacy can happen. The truth of the matter is, is randomness is clumpy. 
Uh, anybody who knows statistics uh, knows this. Uh, if you tell a computer to give you a random sequence of numbers, you are going to find all kinds of patterns within them. And then you can reach all kinds of conclusions that are incorrect about it, right? So if you're just making observations in the world, this is like just think, thinking scientifically, uh, you can come up with random conclusions that aren't really following any uh, specific pattern. You're just seeing a pattern that doesn't in fact exist. This is a big problem with a lot of studies. We're, we're skeptical of studies where it says, you know, Hershey's chocolate put out a study and they say that chocolate helps you with cancer or something. And we're kind of suspicious because we're like, well, if Hershey's doing it, they probably have an agenda. And the truth of the matter is, is they do. And what they do is they will put out a bunch of um, and I'm not saying this is specific. This is just an example. I'm not trying to rag on Hershey chocolate. Don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what they'll do is they'll have a big focus group and they'll give them all chocolate for a certain amount of time. And then what they do is they look at all the possible data of every possible outcome. And then they say, oh, well, it seemed to have this impact. Well, they weren't really looking for that, right? And the truth is, if you look at any random sequence of numbers, you're going to see a certain amount of impact. So what you'll find is those sort of uh, studies are often not replicated because they can't be because all they're doing is finding a random pattern. Now, this thing, same thing happens in other things. Like uh, here's a famous list that people say about Lincoln and Kennedy and all the different uh, connections you can make between them, which is a crazy list. Some of the stuff that ends up on the list is not actually real, but you know, they both won an election in 1860. They both had vice presidents named Johnson. They both had seven letters in their last name. They both were warned about dangers of going to the theater. They were both talking about assass being assassinated on the day they're killed, et cetera, et cetera. There's like so many things, right? And if you're some sort of weird conspiracy theorist or something, you can maybe say, well, these connections are pointing us to something, right? When the truth of the matter is, is you could find any two people and you could go through a list of all different kinds of connections they have to each other. Same thing with psychics, right? Psychics will often claim that they can make um, predictions or they can put you in contact with somebody. And often what you're seeing are the hits, you're missing the misses, and they just edit them out. So like somebody shows up on like Oprah Winfrey and they make all these uh, claims and, and everyone's like, wow, the only way you can know that about my dead Aunt Gladys is because you're contacting the dead. But the truth is they're just throwing a bunch of stuff out there. They edit out the misses and the audience doesn't even pay attention or catch on to that. So it's the same kind of thing, Texas sharpshooter fallacies. Now, the truth of the matter is, is if it's a true hypothesis, it will predict and it will be consistent. And that's what you're looking for when you want to test against uh, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. So in terms of the Bible, let's take a step back to the Bible. Let's imagine how this can manifest itself. So imagine you have a minister who is a very dedicated uh maybe a little OCD about scheduling. Like they're really determined to put in their mind to the congregation that they'll be more productive if they get up early and they're, and they're more systematic about their day. So then they go to the Bible and they find things like, well, look, Abraham went up early in the morning. Okay. And then look, it says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. So obviously the Bible is telling us that the right way to behave is to get up early, right? David rose up early in the morning. But see, then the problem is, is if you expect that to be true, well, first of all, you would expect the Bible might actually have a legitimate law somewhere in the text <laughs> telling you this. But then you also would expect not to see any counterfactual examples, right? But unfortunately, we do. Um, we see things like our eyes are awake before the watches of the night. We see um, that... Um, uh, uh, Jesus was uh, preaching to them in the evening, we, you know, morning to evening. We also have Paul preaching until midnight. So we have examples of good things happening later at night too. So you can't just, you know, pick out those few th examples and make some sort of moral principle about it. You can make that same mistake. You can draw that bullseye. You could say, oh, well, therefore God is telling us we should always wake up early in the morning. No, not necessarily, right? That's not going to actually follow up. <clears throat> now, sometimes what will happen is you'll have a pattern that is kind of like this, where you have a clear correlation, and what somebody will do is they'll draw a circle around this one, the outlier, and then they will make it all about uh, the outlier. 
and so they'll say, well, I can show you in the Bible that this point is true, and they'll give you right, you know, they'll, put, they'll give you this one little dot, but they'll forget about the pattern of the Bible beyond that, right? So, uh, for example, here's one that might come up, you know, where you have the midwives in Exodus, where they tell the Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Which seems like perhaps a dishonest statement, maybe it's not, but it's, it seems like it might be them lying. And then the next uh, sentence is, therefore God dealt well with the midwives. So you can get, well, obviously... Maybe we can lie. Maybe that's not what bearing false witness is, you know. And you can draw all these weird conclusions out of an outlier example. And people do this for a lot of different uh, doctrines. Uh, another, uh, remember when it comes to the, <laughs> what Jesus says, he said, uh, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law till all is fulfilled, right? So we have this continuous pattern that we should accept as a standard sort of, Continue, you know, we should we shouldn't just think of these random offsides as something to really get worried about. We have a continuous pattern of morality through the law, right? Um, we see this in all kinds of things. So, you know, for something like Colossians two fourteen, people will sometimes draw a circle around it and say, "Well, Paul is saying nobody can pass judgment on you, therefore it doesn't really matter one way or the other." But if you came at it from the other bias, you would say. Well, no, he's saying nobody should pass judgment on questions on how you do it. He's not saying it just doesn't matter anymore, right? And so these sort of, like I said, outlier examples that people draw a circle around uh, don't really hold up. Remember, the Sabbath is mentioned or inferred 60 times in the New Testament. Okay, so we have this continuous pattern. And so then when people pull out verses like these, which are basically the only three verses that you could potentially give to move it to Sunday, what they're really doing is just picking out three little dots that are floating out in the middle of nowhere and forgetting about that continuous line. They're committing the same sort of sharpshooter fallacy that a statistician would. Because these, even if these were essentially trying to indicate that, they're such outlier examples, you have to factor them in a certain way. Um, I, obviously, I have my own spin. I don't even think Acts 20 is talking about sun, uh, Sunday in the way that people think. I think it's talking about Saturday night in the modern sense. And I don't know what Revelation 1.10 is even talking about because nobody has a full, <laughs> nobody's really sure what the Lord's day is, right, in Revelation 1.10. So then you just have one example left. But even so, again, what you would have are these, you know, random examples in the midst of this pattern and then they're going to draw a circle around it and tell you and if you look at it graphically it's not instinctually what you think would be true you would expect things in the pattern that would make more sense when using scripture to prove a point you need to kind of ask yourself what kind of evidence would really prove your point right like don't it, while we should go to the Bible and just look at the data and see what the Bible is telling us, if we're trying to make a doctrinal point, we kind of need to take a step back and we need to say, okay, if the Bible was going to try to indicate such, how would it do it? Going back to my morning example, you would have expected in Leviticus or Deuteronomy, it would flat out tell you, wake up early. It's not going to just leave it up to chance. It's not going to bury it in the narrative. The narrative has all kinds of information that's just what happened. It's not necessarily necessarily going to tell you the right way to behave. You have to kind of sort it out, right? So if there's not an explicit law, well, you're on shaky ground to start out with, right? The other problem is what data might contradict your point. Have you looked for the counterfactual? Have you looked for something that would debate against it? So let's say, all right, maybe there's not a direct law that says I should wake up early all the time. But you would say, okay, well, are there anything, are, are there any verses that would indicate it's not a bad idea to be up late? And yes, there are. There are lots of verses that indicate it's not a bad idea to be up late. There's something less righteous about it, right? So that data would refute that point. And it's important to look for it, right? Because sometimes people get hung up on what they've circled around that they forget about all the other points. <laughs> and, and they'll forget a whole pattern, like the pattern, you know, they won't even know about the whole pattern. Here's an example that the Bible shows us, right? The Bible shows us to do this because it puts two verses next to each other that do this. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him himself. And then verse later, it says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So it gives you both examples right next to each other. So we need to, be, we need to understand that sometimes verses isolated 
if you just made a whole religion out of that are really going to throw you off. Don't draw that circle. Look for anything. You have to look through the whole Bible to see if there's anything that might disagree with that. Um, the same thing in Romans. Uh, people do this all the time with Paul. They'll, they'll cherry pick stuff. They'll say, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So I, oh, I guess we don't have to worry about the law anymore. Oh no, but wait, just a few verses later, he says, do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Or um, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. Oh, okay. I guess we don't really have to worry about sin anymore. But no, the next verse is, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace by no means, right? So you always have to look for that other example. Otherwise, you might be circling around that outlier example. And this is kind of a fun thing that happens in Bibles is when they put in these headers, right? So they've broken up what Paul said. So verse 14 and 15 have this weird line as if he finished his thought in 14 and he really didn't. And this also can mislead you. And I think there was a bias, probably an antinomian bias in putting this together, to be perfectly frank. And, you know, be careful. Headers are not part of the original text. This is something to keep in mind. <laughs> so remember, true hypotheses predict... And what we have to look for what data might be a counterfactual. And then, the, of course, the last thing is correlation doesn't equal causation, right? This is something we all know from uh, statistics. And if you don't know, well, here's a basic example. Do you know that there is a correlation between more ice cream sandwiches being sold and there are more shark attacks? There is a direct correlation between the two. And you might be like, well, why in the world are they connected? They're only connected because people buy more ice cream sandwiches in the summertime. And in the summertime, people also go out to the beach. Therefore, there's more shark attacks, right? So we have, we have to be careful with the Bible as well. Sometimes <laughs> we will find things that seem to correlate, but we're looking for a cause and effect that does not exist. Again, it really begs us to go back to the law as much as we can, because uh, this happens a lot in narrative. Uh, you see my example with the midwives, right? The midwives did something, God blessed them, and we can see a correlation there, and we might misinterpret what that was because all the narrative is trying to tell us is what happened, right? It's not necessarily trying to give us moral laws. It's, it's generally a bad idea to look in the narrative and try to plumb out some sort of doctrinal law, right? There's a reason why there are parts of the Bible that are quite explicit about moral guidelines, <laughs> because it, it just adds a lot of clarity to it. Um, you know, but other times this can happen, you know, like the 666, right? People can get hot and bothered about 666 and they can find 666 anywhere. They can find it on Monster Energy because they say the three symbols on there look like Vobs and Vobs is the sixth letter. And so therefore, and it's a monster, so it's demonic, right? And they go on this whole big tangent. You know, and I don't know, maybe the artists were being subversive when they designed a Monster Energy drink. But on the other hand, I don't think you're worshiping Satan when you drink one. <laughs> So just remember things like that too. Just because you see a correlation between two things doesn't mean that they caused it. Again, going back to the sharpshooter, right? He had his he had his bullet hole and he drew the circle around it. One did not cause the other. They're they're completely out of order and it's a misapplication of logic to assume there's even a correlation or a, a cause between them, right? So there we go. So if you avoid those things, uh, you can help yourself avoid the sharpshooter fallacy. They've made their evil blood. 
graveyard returns a shot of them Surprise they feel the wound They brought be proclaimed. I'm speaking to you now. I want to tell you a story about a monastery where the monks took a vow of silence. It was a place where people were silent. But once a year, they would gather together. And if somebody uh, had, would be moved to speak, that person could get up and say something. So one year, they, the monks all gathered together. And one of the monks got up and said, the, I hate to say, I don't like saying this, but the food here is awful. Okay. A year went by. They gathered together again. <laughs> all right. Another monk got up and he said, In my opinion, the food here is delicious. Another year went by. <laughs> then the abbot stood up and he said, There'll be no talking at all until you stop this bickering. <laughs> <laughs> the good news that must be proclaimed. In the Jordan River, John the Baptist was doing, you know, he was baptizing. And then Jesus Christ came along, and after John was in prison, the gospel was being preached. In the book of Mark, we see, and this is the interlinear, so you can see the word in Greek, uh, the, the, the word is evangelion, mm -hmm. the ending here is different because of the grammar. Evangelion, or, or uh, good news. Gospel means good news. And so... Uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What is that gospel? It's found in the 14th verse. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So there's good news in that ultimately God will be ruling this world. Jesus Christ will be ruling this world. And so we're to pray your kingdom come. But more than that, we're supposed to let people know about it. But we do pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the key to success in the world. If we on earth are doing God's will as it's done in heaven. Now the kingdom of God, I was taught as a, as a young Christian, has four elements. A kingdom has four elements. It has a king. Jesus Christ is the king. It has laws. Laws are going to come out of the out of the based on the Bible, okay? The Word of God. It has territory, which is ultimately going to be the whole world, and it has subjects. Those are the four elements of a kingdom, and the subjects will be all of humankind. Now, in the um, it, when the apostles came to Galilee, this is a scene uh, should be a scene of Galilee. Mm -hmm. when, they, when they came to Galilee after his resurrection, they were told this by Jesus Christ. This was his command. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so he told them, uh, uh, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. He told them, go out and proclaim the message. And on the Mount of Olives, before his ascension, he said something similar. Uh, therefore, when they had come together, the, the apostles, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons 
which the Father has put in his own authority. So what, was, what, what were they to do then? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You know, the Pentecost was coming up. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so the church continues now uh, to proclaim that message. Here you have uh, Israeli f uh, folk dancers. Uh, one of the uh, folk dances they do is to the scripture in uh, Isaiah 52 and verse 7. It's a beautiful melody and they dance while singing the words from Isaiah 52, 7 that we'll quote to you later on. But uh, Paul quotes it in the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, Paul tells us, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who all call upon him, for her, and he quotes from the book of Isaiah, for whoever, or I'm sorry, from the book of Joel, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he goes on to say, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? And Jesus Christ did, in fact, send his apostles. And, and the church ha should have a, a, an organized, uh, appropriate way to ordain ministers to continue that over the, sa over the years. And uh, he quotes from uh, Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Now we're going to demonstrate that to you. Daniel and I are going to take our shoes and socks off and you'll see. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, how beautiful. Anyway, let's go back to that statement. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And in Isaiah 52, verse 7 is the original song, which as original verse, as I said, which has now become a, a folk melody in Israel. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of, of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So the, the message is involving the kingdom of God. Now, why should the gospel be preached? Why is the church commissioned, commanded, to preach the good news of the coming kingdom of God? Number one, for encouragement. If people, even if they're not fully on board with, 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 with our beliefs and practices, but if they have a knowledge that things are going to work out ultimately, God has a plan, history is going ultimately in a positive direction, it's encouragement. In a couple of weeks, Jews are going to be reading from Isaiah 40. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. So it's our commission to comfort, to uh, give comfort, which the gospel message is a message of comfort. Number two. If we preach from the Bible, it's a positive influence. People may not come fully, as I said, on board, but they could be influenced in a positive direction when they hear God's word. They could be convicted in certain ways. The so-called Sermon on the Mount, uh, when we preach those, those principles, for example, the golden rule in Matthew 7 and verse 12, if people hear it, 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 could, it, it could, in fact, it has. The Bible has influenced in a positive direction human behavior over the centuries. Therefore, wherever you, whatever you, God, Jesus said uh, in Matthew 7, 12, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. A third reason, as you, as you heard in the, in the original command that he gave, is to be a witness. The world needs to know that, in fact, God has informed them ahead of time what he's going to do. You know, so therefore, they, they can understand. You heard it, you were told, you were told the implications of, of, of self-destructive behavior, and the implications of positive behavior, and you were, and you were told what, what God ultimately plans to do. You heard it all ahead of time. And so therefore, once the kingdom comes, it will speed up the process of their conversion. When they realize they actually had heard about it ahead of time, it will actually, as I said, speed up their response. And uh, here we see in Matthew 24, 14, that right before Jesus returns, there'll be a rather intense uh, pro proclamation of the gospel uh, prior to his return, and, uh, as we see in this prophecy. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, another purpose of the preaching of the gospel is that God uses it in order to recruit his team that he's going to use to govern the world under Jesus Christ, choosing the first fruits. 
Now you heard a reading of the first two chapters of James this morning. Let's focus on James 1.18. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So God isn't saving the world now, but he is choosing certain ones to be a part of, of those who, who will in fact save the world during the millennium. He uh, also tells the church, speaking to his apostles before his arrest, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, if you went to a synagogue last night, you would have heard Psalm 96, among others, and uh, it mentions in the second verse, sing to the Lord, bless his name, bring tidings every day of his rescue. This is the way it's translated in the Robert Alter translation. But that word rescue is uh, Yeshua, uh, 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 Yeshua or Yeshuot, and it talks about salvation. Uh, let me, let's see. I think, yeah, I'm not sure if it's plural or singular there, but the word is, is salvation. So salvation, though, is a rescue because uh, we are faced with eternal death or eternal life. Salvation grants us eternal life. But more than that, eternal, eternal life, the implication is, it, obviously, and when you read the Bible, eternal life on the spirit level, a far greater life than what we would have now on the physical level. And it is a rescue from eternal death. In Mark 16 and verse 15, we see the uh, same uh, command that we saw in Matthew 28. And he said to them, Go into, the, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now the time is coming when the last trumpet will sound and these prophecies will be fulfilled and this proclamation that we have made uh, of, of salvation, and it is now that I think of it, by the way, Yeshua back there in Psalm 96, uh, of salvation, Yeshua, of the kingdom of God, well, the time is coming when that will be fulfilled and it will actually come and there will be a, that seventh trumpet uh, to uh, prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. As we read in Revelation 11:15, Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So between now and then, we have good news that must be proclaimed. A37, a free clothing ministry, is reopening its doors to the community after being shut down for two years. And Fox Carolina's Lindsay Gibbs is live this morning at the new Share with a Purpose location in Greenville. Hey, that's right. We're here at Renovation Church. That's where things are going to get started here in just a little bit. Starting at 930, you're going to be able to get free clothes. You can see signs like this lining the streets. They're going to be down Edwards Road all the way from Botany Woods to Wade Hampton Boulevard. Now, this is going to be the new home for Share With A Purpose. It's a clothing ministry. Now, this group has been hard at work preparing for their first event in the last two years. They had to close down because of the pandemic, and they're so excited to be back. We actually got a chance to go see them set up yesterday in preparation for this event. Now, this all began um, in 2012 share with a purpose ministry that's when they started giving away free and gently used clothes they did have to close their doors um close their doors over at brook glen elementary during the pandemic for safety reasons but starting today they're reopening in a new location here at renovation church we actually got a chance to sit down with an organizer rebecca bishop about the event that will help those in need find clothes I realize that the you know the tax-free weekend's coming up and people don't want to have to spend their tax-free dollars. Uh, they have a limited amount. So they don't want to have to spend all of it on clothes or all of it on supplies. So typically, you know, you're having to pick what you can get. Well, if we can supply the clothes, then they have more that they can spend on the other needs that they have. 
And the plan is to give away all the clothes that were donated this weekend. They say because it is their first event back, they may have less than what they normally have, which is why they're encouraging people to come out and donate over the next couple of days as well. Now, if you want to attend, we did put together the details there for you on your screen. It's going to be here at Renovation Church today through Saturday. This is going to be their first event on a Saturday. They're really excited about that. It's going to begin at 930 and last until about 4 p.m. Now, again, you can bring your clothing items here to donate if you missed a drop-off location. They say they're really looking for boys in men's clothes as well. For now, reporting in Greenville, Lindsay Gibbs, Fox Carolina News. And uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to that group because that's actually a Sabbatarian group uh, in um, that area. And I uh, converse often with uh, one of the pastors there. So if Aaron Bishop is watching, hello out there. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, of course, this is a biblical example. You know, it says the one who has two tunics is to share with the one who has none. And the one who has food is to do likewise. So it is nice to see uh, some uh, Sabbath keeping groups uh, contributing a charity in their local areas. So you definitely deserve some accolades for following the scriptural mandate. Scripture of the week, Matthew 6, 20 through 6, 21. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. is known among his people every mouth his praises fill from of old he has established his abode on Zion's hill there he broke the sword and arrow made the noise of war be still Excellent and glorious are you with your trophies from the fray. You have slain the mighty warriors, wrapped in sleep of death are they. When your anger once is risen, who can stand in that dread day?
King of Glory. His name is Jesus, Jesus, wonderful Counselor, mighty God. His name is Jesus, Jesus, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus, Jesus, wonderful Counselor, mighty God. His name is Jesus, Jesus, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. for joining us again this week um please like and subscribe to this uh, youtube channel for more services and keep in mind we are hosting a festival of tabernacles event in the orlando area so if you'd like to join us for that just let us know you can contact us through this youtube channel or through our facebook page uh we're going to be launching a website pretty soon as well and uh, we will see you in the future